the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today's gospel passage is probably one of, if not, uh, the most favorite gospel story. You just mention the prodigal son, and people can often recall the story with ease. Of course, the power of the story is what the father does. Forgives his wayward son without the son ever even having a chance to apologize. But if you are anything like me, forgiveness does not usually come this easy. As a tradition, Christianity and really Jesus himself asks us to do the impossible. We are called to live lives of radical radical forgiveness, not only of those we love, but in particular, those we don't. So think of all the common phrases that we hear about forgiveness, some of which, to be honest, are quite trivial, and some which are actually quite profound. Here's a few examples you might already know by heart. Forgive, but never forget. It's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. To err is human. To forgive is divine. Or my uh, personal favorite by a theologian named Lewis, Lewis Smedes, such a funny name, Lewis Smedes. He says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. But what has always eluded me is not the call to forgive. That seems honestly pretty obvious in Jesus' words from Scripture. No, what has eluded me is the how. In other words, the mechanics, the mechanics of forgiveness, particularly in situations where real pain or harm has occurred. How exactly are we supposed to, quote, unquote, get over it? How are we to get over it? How do you forgive the betrayal of a dear friend who you trusted deeply? How do you forgive the driver who was speeding and crashes into you recklessly? How do you forgive the spouse who has cheated on you? How do you forgive another who has gossiped about you and trashed your image? How do you forgive another who has abused you? How do you forgive another who has no intention of ever apologizing? Well, to be even more cliche, we are told forgiveness is a process. And I think this one cliche is actually quite true. So, what's the process? What's the process? According to the theologian I mentioned before, Louis Schmid, the process looks something like this, and it has three very important and very difficult steps. The first step in truly forgiving another is giving up, is giving up the desire to punish them. Giving up the desire to punish them. Again, this is easier said than done. but it's really quite crucial. Think uh, about a kind of trivial example. Somebody cuts you off on the highway, and you think, God, I hope that person gets a ticket. Or maybe even worse, you think, God, I hope that person gets into an accident. Think of how often we talk about karma. In other words, the person getting what they have coming to them. We say, what goes around comes around. Well, as Christians called to forgive, we are called to renounce all these ways. We are called to fight against the desire for karma. Instead, we consciously and with real effort give up the right to get even. In some ways, this first step may be the hardest and the one that actually we avoid the most. Why? 
Well, I think simply righteous anger and the desire for revenge comes quite naturally to each of us. You can actually feel, at least in the moment, after the person has cut you off on the highway, quite satisfying. Who knows if this is a result of, million of millions of years of evolution or just further proof of original sin. The reality is that desire to get even is quite real and quite tenacious, which is why it must be addressed first, which is why for Schmieds, that's the first step, giving up the right to get even. The second step flows from this quite naturally, and is this. We consciously try to rediscover the humanity of the other person. In other words, we don't reduce them to simply the worst thing they have ever done. We take as much time and we take as much effort to see the larger story of their lives. But we don't do this to excuse their actions or to minimize the harm done. No, we try to see the humanity of the other person so we can avoid a very dangerous path which is forgetting that they too are beloved by God, even in the midst of their own sin. And so are we. Again, we don't make excuses for others when they sin against us, and we don't make excuses for ourselves when we sin against others. We just try to recognize that we're all, quote unquote, living in sin. The third step is the fruit of working diligently on the first two steps. The third step is this. We wish our wrongdoer well. Wish our wrongdoer well. Or in the language of Jesus, we learn to pray for our enemies. So why on earth would we pray for those who have hurt us? Why on earth would we pray for those who have abused us? Why would we do this? Well, Schmieds calls this practice spiritual surgery. Spiritual surgery. And here are his words, and I want to share them with you. Magnanimous forgiveness allows the possibility of transformation in the guilty party process of spiritual surgery. When you forgive someone, you slice away the wrong from the person who did it. You disengage that person from his or her hurtful act. You recreate the person. At one moment, you identify him as the person who did you wrong. The next moment, you change that identity. He or she is remade in your memory. This process of remaking the other is how we can wish them well, how we can pray for them. Now, let me state the very, 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 very obvious. All of these steps take time. They often take more time than we are encouraged to give them. All of these steps are impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. And all of these three steps help us to recognize the marks of true forgiveness. Smeeds is also careful to note that forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. For example, a person who has been abused is called to forgive his or her abuser. But for very important and personal healing reasons. Primarily, the person is called to forgive so that the pain of the abuse can be released and not wreak more harm. But in almost all cases, the abused would not, would not reconcile with the abuser. Smeeds also recognizes that you may have to re-forgive the same event or hurt. I had an experience where a relative had hurt me deeply. I thought, I 
thought I had forgiven her, but I realized that I still couldn't wish her well. Still couldn't wish her well. So I started over. I started offering her to God's judgment, not my own. I started consciously remembering her acts of kindness and love, not just the horrible act of hurt. I started praying for her well-being and that she would know God's love. See, the power of these three steps is not just that they help us forgive. I think they do help us with that. The power of them is that they name how God has forgiven you and how God has forgiven me. That the form of God's judgment of us is mercy. That God chooses to see us in Christ and not in the worst things we have done. That God always wishes for us wholeness and healing. If we come to see how God has forgiven us in this way, then I think we are freer to see how we can offer this kind of forgiveness to each other. Or, to put it more succinctly and much better in the words of Jesus, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us.